With all my hopes and dreams and plans I place within your hands, Lord And give my life to you What you want of me, Lord, I give my life to you and all of my hopes and dreams and plans I place within your hands, Lord, and give my life to you. All I ever want to be is what you want of me. Thank you girls for that. That was beautiful. Really appreciate you playing for us this morning, Nicole, and both Nicole and Brooke singing the special for us. That was a blessing. And welcome this morning to Truth Baptist Church for our live stream only service. Uh, I know that this wasn't something that we had expected just last Sunday, and none of us knew that this is what we would be doing. Uh, but here we are uh, just for a live stream only service today. Uh, at 10.30, and we'll do so again tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, here in the last few minutes, I've already met some people outside, uh, a couple of visitors, and got a chance to meet them, meet with a gentleman and some others, and uh, they said that they've been watching online already. So I'm excited about that. Listen, uh, word's getting out, and people are watching our live stream services. I hope that you have been, if you've not been able to be with us. You have a lot more company today, and I want to encourage you, if you are watching by way of live stream this morning, would you just let us know that you're here? Maybe you've already done so. Say hello, uh, like this stream, love it, share it, let people know that you're watching, and just say hello to the other church family that are here and that are watching as well, if you don't mind doing so. Uh, that way we can kind of just feel like we're all together. And I know you might be at your kitchen table or at your couch, but I hope you have your Bibles with you and that you can sit up straight and uh, kind of focus in for just the next little while as we look into God's Word. And again, we want to thank you for being here. I hope the message got out to as many people as possible that we're doing this just for today. And let me take a moment and say that I have some good news. Many of you know the reason why we're just live streaming only today was because uh, I got a call Wednesday that one of our members who was in a connection class on uh, Sunday uh, had a test taken for where this person works down the road at Covenant Woods and received a positive uh, test on Wednesday for their Monday test that they had to take. Uh, and they, re they received a positive for that. And so with it being so close to the previous Sunday and the amount of people that were together in that class, uh, this is why we have done things like this. It's very unusual that we would, but just due to the circumstances of uh, there being a number of people that might have had a possible close contact in a classroom together for about 30 to 40 minutes or so, we decided to uh, take things in this direction just for today. Now, the good news is this. Uh, first of all, we're praying for the person who's positive, and I hear that uh, this person's doing better. Uh, however, the other people that uh, were in the class, I've kept in touch with all of them, and I even touched base with everybody yesterday who was in that, uh, it was a singles connection class, and all the people that were in that class that I contacted uh, are all fine. There's no symptoms. Everyone's just feeling as good as normal, and so that is great great news. And so we rejoice about that. It seems like uh, this positive case has been contained to one family. And so we are praying for that family. And many of us know that it's the Williams family. So we're praying for the Williams, if you'll remember them in prayer. We pray and trust that you're feeling better and doing better or, or that you'll continue to get better in the days ahead. So pray for them as well as any others who we know who might be battling the virus. Uh, I know that there's a number of people who have had it and come through it on the other side now. 
Some who might be in the midst of it right now, maybe you're watching and you're battling it right now as you're watching this. We're praying for you. We're praying for family members of yours. And we want to let you know that we're with you and we hope and pray that you're doing okay. But thank you again for tuning in. Uh, let me give a couple of announcements if I can. Because this is just a temporary pause for us doing live stream only, we are going to be back in person starting this Wednesday. And I would encourage you, due to the contained nature of this one case and this with the Williams family, I, I want to encourage you, would you come on Wednesday and be with us? And it would be a great time to be back together in person Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Our kids' programs will be back again. And we'll have our Flyers Club and our Kings Kids. They'll be meeting together at the normal 7 o'clock time. We'll have our midweek service up here with our adults like we usually do. And the teenagers will be at 6 o'clock, starting at 6 o'clock downstairs in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, that's grades 7 through 12, age 12 through 18. And uh, I hope that you'll be a part of all of that. And then next Sunday, we'll be all in person like we usually are uh, for our connection class time at 930 morning service at 10 30 uh, evening service at six o'clock our connection class all the adults meet in here for the winter time uh, we will not be, be getting new adult classes until once we get into the spring or early summer so keep that in mind we do have our teen connection class and our single young adult connection class once everyone's better at least the once the williams are feeling better to to meet again and once that class meets again, we will have them in the fellowship hall. We won't put them in a classroom any longer so that they'll have more room. And I'll probably move the teen connection class to one of the other classrooms and out of my office. We have the space down there to do that. And that should be fine and give adequate space to everybody while all the adults can be here in the auditorium. So remember all those things, if you would. Uh, I'm excited about our theme for the year. Our theme for 2021 is Overcome. Overcome in 2021, uh, we have our pins. So if you come next Sunday, you will get a pin that you can wear proudly on your lapel. Some people put on their Bible covers and so forth, and we'll have that available to you. I hope you'll come, you'll receive that. And next Sunday is Vision Sunday. We would have had that Sunday be today. However, due to everything, we've just moved it to next Sunday. And next Sunday night at six o'clock will be our Vision Sunday night service. I even received a phone call from someone last night that said we'd like to come and visit and uh, we want to come next Sunday night. And I said that would be a perfect uh, service to come to because it'll be our vision night service. We'll give out a calendar for the year. We'll cast a vision for 2021 and what we hope to see accomplished as the Lord directs us. And so remember that as well. Uh, we also have online giving today, so if you have something to give, I know you're not here in person, you can go to our website, truthbaptistchurch.com. You can take care of your tithes and offerings there at the online secure giving link there on the homepage of the website, truthbaptistchurch.com. Well, it's all about the Word of God and getting into the Word of God and hearing from God's Word this morning. So let's do that. Would you turn with me, and I hope you have your Bibles with you, to John chapter 16. John chapter 16 this morning, we're going to read verses 32 and 33. In this year of overcoming, I want to spend at least the month of January uh, and maybe a little further into February thinking about overcoming different things. And we can look to God's word and see what the Lord has overcome. We as God's people have the blessing and benefit of overcoming whatever he has overcome as well. And that's an encouragement to us. This morning we're thinking about this, overcoming the world. Let's look at John chapter 16 beginning in verse 32. John chapter 16 verse 32. There the Bible says, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world." And so think with me for a few minutes about that phrase, I have overcome the world. Let's ask the Lord for his help as we look into his word together this morning. 
Father, we come to you now. We pray for your help. We pray that you would, uh, Lord, direct us and help us to know what we need to know from your word this morning. We want to overcome. And Lord, we want to do so with your help and your direction. I pray that we would understand that this world is not our home. Oh, I know we live here in the here and now. That it is not our ultimate destination. Help us with that. Encourage us with that. Lord, help us to understand that with you, we can live as though heaven is our home because it truly is. And I pray that we would understand what that looks like for us. Thank you for conquering sin, death, and the grave and overcoming this world. And Lord, I ask that we would be focused on you like never before is our example. Oh, how we need your example in these days. Be with us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All of us can relate to the phrase, there is no place like home. Uh, I'm sure you can uh, give an amen to that right now, sitting in your home. And I hope you do feel like that, that there's truly no place like home. And I know that we would like to be together in person today, but I hope that you're enjoying your home and your family this morning, if that's where you are. You know, the truth is we can be anywhere uh, doing anything, and there might be some places that we really enjoy going, that we really enjoy visiting and being at from time to time, but all of us, without a doubt, can say with a certainty that there's truly no place like home. Right now, as I'm preaching this message, uh, I have a brother, and most of you know that I have two brothers and a sister. I'm the oldest, and uh, so of course I'm the wisest, and uh, I'm joking about that, but I am the oldest, and uh, so I think I, I should be preferred because I'm the oldest, but uh, the next in line to me is my brother Ben, and he's about three years younger than me, and then uh, Maddie is about four, four and a half years younger than Ben, I believe, and then Casey, and Casey just turned 30 years old and has a baby herself, and that's exciting. Uh, but I'm the oldest, and, and so Ben, I think, is 38 years old, and he is making a big move. And so right now, as I'm preaching this message, he and his family have uh, decided that they are relocating, and they've packed up all their belongings, all their earthly goods, and my brother and his four children are right now traveling to Tennessee. They decided to get out of Virginia and move to Tennessee, and uh, the Lord led them to do that. Uh, they have no family in Tennessee. All their family is still here in Virginia. Uh, there is no other connection to Tennessee other than uh, really just what he believes is the Lord's leading in his life. And my, how we are going to miss them, and uh, it'll be sad that they'll be 10 hours away, uh, but we'll still get to visit from time to time. And as I think about that, I think, you know, they are forming an entirely new home in a new place. For me and for my family, I can't, I can't explain it uh, any better than just saying Mechanicsville. Because Mechanicsville is home to us, and you know that. Uh, we love this place. Uh, I'll never forget driving here to consider if this would be the place where God would have us to start a church and, uh, almost, almost 15 years ago now. And I can remember driving up and seeing that windmill. And I thought, that's interesting to see a windmill of all things right here in central Virginia. And I drove a little bit further and started driving down the road, down 360. And I saw just a few restaurants here and there and some neighborhoods. And it just seemed like a place where God could do a work. And he led us to this place. And here we are. And we're so thankful that this is where he has brought us. And every time we drive down 360 or even Pole Green Road or Route 301, we just feel like we are home. And there's really no place like it when you know that you're where God wants you to be. However, I'll also say this. As much as we love Central Virginia and Mechanicsville specifically, it is not our eternal home. While we're here for but a short time, our life after our time on earth, is forever. And that's where we will spend eternity, wherever that might be. And the reason I say wherever is because we're not all guaranteed heaven. The Bible says there is eternity after this life. 
And we'll either spend an eternity with the Lord in heaven forever or separated from God in a place called hell. I hope you know where your eternal destination is. And while we spend our lives on earth and have temporary homes on earth and our souls are even temporarily housed in these bodies that we walk around on the earth in, none of it compares to our true home or our final destination. All of us know how uh, to, all of us know and love the Lord, and all of us who know and love the Lord who are watching this can probably relate to Abraham, who in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 9, the Bible says, sojourned as in a strange country, and he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. It was Jesus who in John 17 prayed that his father wouldn't take his people out of the world, but that he would keep them from evil. Uh, he then said that they, that being we, are not of this world, even as he is not of this world. I like that phrase, don't you? Not of this world. Uh, I know there's, I think, one or two of the men in our church have a sticker uh, that's on the back of their vehicle or the back window of their vehicle, and it has those letters, N-O-T-W. What is that? N-O-T-W. And that's typically what people will ask or question when they see that on the back of their vehicle. And then it's a good opportunity to share with people, oh, that stands for not of this world. We are not of this world. I hope we recognize that in these days that this world is truly not our home. We are just coming off of a week where we saw some, what a lot of people would say are shocking and maybe even some confusing things that have taken place in our country, uh, some unsettling things that have happened. And I, I'm not going to get into everything that has taken place. You, you're smart, you watch the news, you're aware of what's going on. But if we don't know now more than at any time that we're not of this world, then we're just not paying attention. We are not of this world. This is not our home. And I can tell you, I am thankful that this place is not our eternal home. I'm glad that we have a citizenship that is somewhere else. You see, we have a citizenship that is in a place called heaven if we've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven. Conversation there literally means citizenship. And so we are citizens of another place. Oh, we live here temporarily, but our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now quickly, in our text, Jesus has been communicating to his disciples about what life will be like after he is gone. And he's telling them, I'm going to go away. However, I will send to you another comforter. And we know and understand that that comforter is the person of the Holy Spirit. It's God who dwells with us and in us, in the Holy Spirit. And he says to them that he has spoken what he has to them in this passage, so that they might have peace. The Lord wants his people to have peace. And as I said last week, and I've said here several times recently, we need to strive for peace and to live peaceably with all men. Uh, there's nothing noteworthy in trying to not be peaceful. Uh, there's nothing uh, special about trying to be uh, at odds with people. And if we need to defend ourselves and we have no other option, then of course that's the option that we have to take. But that should be the last option, and that should not be something that we're seeking or desiring. Listen, none of us want to uh, be at odds, and none of us should desire to be in a violent confrontation or any kind of uh, hurtful confrontation with anyone. That's not our desire. That's not what we as God's people strive to do and strive to be like. We are striving for peace in these days. And the Lord says He wants us to have that. Peace is something that God gives. And it only is possible through knowing and following His Son, Jesus. In the next phrase, He says this in our text, In the world will have, tribu uh, will have tribulation. Tribulation here means trouble. 
trials, difficulty, and opposition. And I don't need to develop that very much because we already understand it. We can see the tribulation that's around us. We can see the trouble and the trials and the opposition that we face uh, sometimes on a a moment-by-moment basis in certain seasons of life. However, he says in this passage, be of good cheer. So while we face difficulty and opposition and trials in this life, here's the good news and here's the encouragement. He says, be of good cheer. Now, why would the Lord tell us that? Because I know I don't feel like being of good cheer when I'm in the midst of trouble and difficulty. But the Lord encourages us with that thought. You can be of good cheer. The Lord wouldn't tell us to be of good cheer if we couldn't in the midst of our trouble, in the midst of our trials. But he's told us that we are to be that way because we can. Cheer here speaks of comfort and contentment. You can have peace, comfort, and contentment even in the midst of turmoil. Even in the midst of difficulty and trials. And here's the reason why. He says in the passage, because I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And that's what I want us to consider for the next few moments. Now, Jesus Christ has overcome the world, and we can only overcome through Him. And so before we even consider at all, What it means to overcome, just understand it's only possible if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. And my hope and prayer this morning is that you've done that. Listen, we can play music this morning and I can preach about a variety of different things and we can give announcements and we can be looking forward to the time that we'll meet together in person again here in just a few days. But far more important than any of those things that we've discussed or considered this morning is this. Do you know Jesus Christ? Have you trusted in Him alone for salvation? Can you look back on a time where you know without a shadow of a doubt that you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for eternal life? Have you done that? Is your belief and is your faith in Him? Can you say, I know in whom I believed? I know that my faith is in the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. And we simply get there by acknowledging that we're sinners and confessing that sin before God and calling upon Him to save us from our sin and trusting in His death on the cross and His shed blood and His burial and His resurrection to save us. If you've done that, then you can overcome as well. Because your ability to overcome is not in your own power or your own might or your own religiosity. It's not through any of those things. Your power is through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your ability to do what you have done is through Christ and through Christ alone. And so we have a responsibility. And our responsibility is to conduct ourselves in this world with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ who helps us to overcome it. We can't overcome it in our own strength, so how do we do so? Well, here's how we do so. First and foremost, the Bible instructs us, love not the world. Love not the world. We begin there. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Uh, The word world here in our passage means this, cosmos, cosmos. Uh, Maybe you've heard that before, but cosmos is an interesting word. As we see the word world in the word of God, it, it denotes sometimes the physical universe, That is, the world as it appears to the eye. The world considered as the work of God, as a material creation. That that would be one aspect of the cosmos. There's another aspect, and that is the world as applied to the people that reside in it. Uh, That would be the world of mankind. And so we think of the cosmos, the physical universe, 
The world as applied to the people that reside in it, mankind. And then yet, as we see it in this passage and in many places throughout Scripture, it also can refer to the yet unredeemed inhabitants of the earth that have a lifestyle and system of beliefs in which they function that is opposed to God and His Word. Now, does that sound like our world? It certainly does. It's a lifestyle and a system of beliefs in which people function opposed to God and opposed to His Word. James chapter 4 and verse 4 says this, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And so we understand that this world is at enmity. It's the enemy of God. It's the enemy of who we believe in and who we stand for and who we follow after. And so we just must understand the reason why we can't be too comfortable in this world is because we're living in a world that is diametrically opposed to our God and to our system of beliefs and to our faith. Understand that. We live in a place that's diametrically opposed to all that we know and believe to be true from the Word of God. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't live. There's basic living and existing in this life that is not wicked and is not sinful. We, we have to function to a certain extent to survive in this life, and the Lord wants us to do that. He's not called us to die. He's called us to live. In order to live, we have to do basic things to exist in this world. However, our worldview and what we believe about its origin the existence of man and his purpose, as well as eternity. It must be what we know from the Word of God and not from we, what we gather from the cosmos, the system of man that is among us. And so the question then is this, how are we to live? <laughs> how are we to live? Well, as the Lord said, we are to not be of it. We are to live in this place and in this world as much as we are able to without becoming of this place. And so while we are, we are in it, we are determining that we are not going to be of it. We often will say it this way, in the world and yet not of the world. That's the difference. Uh, the Lord prayed that while He was... In it, he was not of it. He prayed that the Father would not take us out of it, but that we would live in it and be of it as he has desired us to be. And so we begin by not loving this world. Don't love this world. Don't love what's here. Don't love uh, what is around us. Don't love the people system that we are in. This is not what we're here for. We're not uh, to be a part of the system around us. We are not to even begin to love it or become friendly to it, I should say. We might say, well, I, you know, I, I'm not like the world, but I, I kind of like dabbling a little bit, or I like to be connected in some ways. And listen, I understand that Jesus, he sat and he dined with publicans and with sinners. I understand that. I acknowledge that. And if we're ever to reach people for the Lord, we have to be in this world. Oh, but we must be determined and resolved by the grace of God and the help of God every day that we will not become like the world around us. That with the help of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will not conform to it. And that's my second thought. Don't be conformed to the world. We are to not love the world or even become friendly with it. But secondly, don't be conformed to it. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says this, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
While we battle the allure and the temptation of the world, we are clearly instructed to not be conformed to it. The word conform here means to fashion alike to the same pattern. So we are not to take on those same characteristics. We are not to become like something that is radically different than who we are. And it would be wise, I think, for us to every day regularly take an account of our lives and honestly assess if we're discernible, if our life and our testimony is discernible from those who are lost and living in the world system. Here's a good question for us to ask concerning whether or not uh, we are conforming to the world. When you see yourself and your testimony and how you live, uh, let me ask this question. Does it look like the world? Does it look like the lost in this world? Can people just by looking at you determine that you're different than the majority of those who are lost and without Christ in this world? Can they see a, a direct difference, a very clear, discernible difference, even in your appearance and then in your countenance? and your testimony, and how you conduct yourself. Now, here's some obvious behaviors that I think we should understand this morning. But these are behaviors that are behaviors of the world, not of God's people. Boozing and carousing. Oh, I know that we don't hear much preaching on this today, but if, if we're living just for the next buzz, just to get to the place where we're at the weekend again, so we can get drunk again, so we can just booze it up again, and if we're just living for getting out and partying in the way that the world parties and get together with those who live it up in that way, and we can't wait to get with that group that does those things and talks in that way and uh, looks and smells and acts like the world, if that's what we're living for, we're living just like the world. No Christian should look like that or act like that, boozing and carousing and partying and uh, living that lifestyle that a sinful person in this world who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And while we're all sinners, uh, we've been redeemed from all of that. Praise the Lord. You might say, that's not a problem for me, Pastor. I don't live that way. Okay, what about our speech? How do you talk? Do your words betray who you say that you are? What kind of language do you use? Do you use profane language? Is profanity something that you resort to? Is it something that you find yourself engaging in? And as I preach these things, I know that there are some people who think, well, this isn't a problem, Pastor, for people at Truth Baptist Church. I've lived long enough to understand there's a lot of things going on with the people at Truth Baptist Church or any church that nobody knows anything about except for God or maybe others that aren't a part of this church family. I'm not naive. I understand that we're all sinners and we all struggle. And I will say, some people might come here and they might say amen on Sunday, and they might sing the hymns, and I'm glad that you do. But you might also struggle with your words throughout the week. Maybe you were brought up that way. Maybe you heard profane language in your home, maybe from your own parents. And, and you, it's a struggle for you because it's almost ingrained into you and in how you were brought up. But I will say this, there is no previous behavior, there is no upbringing that the Holy Spirit can't help you to overcome. Profanity, maybe it's off-color speech. Maybe it's just a subtle little off-color statement. Maybe it's a word that has a double meaning. Maybe it's an implication or an innuendo or something else in what you say. Maybe it's entertainment, and it's maybe entertainment that is entrenched in worldliness. We have to be so guarded and careful about what we take in, what our sources are. What are your sources? Where do you find your entertainment? Where do you find your information? And is it something that is directly connected to this world and its system? It seems like everybody today has a screen has a phone, has a device, has something in front of them. And I will tell you, it is, I believe, ripping our world apart. People are 
They're in a trance, it seems like, by the screen that they have in front of them constantly. And what we're taking in and what we're reading and what we're looking at and observing and being entertained by can be worldliness on a level that begins to mold us and shape us and conform us, maybe not even outwardly yet, but inwardly in our own mind or in our own heart. And may God help us. As we watch those things and observe those things, it can change the way we think about certain behaviors. Let me ask this question. What's our approach to sex? What is our approach to intimate relationships? Do we believe that that's okay outside the safe confines and bounds of marriage? Or do we believe that it's just a casual behavior that people can uh, engage in as they feel comfortable? If we even begin to think that way, we are becoming conformed to the world. Intimate relationships are always between a man and a woman and always to be reserved for the safe confines of marriage. You know, I say that today and some people would look at me and say, you're a dinosaur. You're a fossil. No one thinks or believes that way anymore. And number one, there's a lot more people that do than maybe people realize. But secondly, God does and his word does, and so I'm going to follow the word of God. We might say, well, it's not the physical act I'm involved in. Okay, but what are you gazing at? What are you watching? Pornography is rampant today, and it's wicked. It's, it's of the devil. And... I, I believe it's conforming the hearts of men and women to the system of this world. The system of our world says, that's okay. That's all right. That behavior is just normal. It's normal, acceptable behavior. And the Lord says otherwise. Job said, how can I look upon a maid to lust after her? Listen, uh, how can I do that? The Bible says in God's Word that if we lust after someone in our own heart, it's as though we've committed the very act of adultery itself. I've named some obvious things, but all of this is worldliness. It's worldly behavior. And you know, when we get out in this world and we intermingle a little bit, which we should do so that we can try to reach people for the Lord, we should also have this feeling of, I know I'm not at home here. I can't be truly comfortable. When Jesus sat with the publicans and sinners, he was there to help them to come to the truth. I don't think Jesus sat there fully comfortable, but he sat there with the intention of trying to win them to the truth. And listen, we are in this world, and we are trying to win people to the truth. But we should never feel comfortable at, at, or at home with that lifestyle, with the worldliness that is around us. We need to ask ourselves this morning, are we continually feeding the flesh rather than being filled with and led by the Spirit? And so, don't love the world. Don't be conformed to the world. But we'll truly overcome if, third and finally, we don't invest too much into this world. Matthew chapter 6, you can turn there, I hope you will. I should hear the pages turning all the way through the internet. I want to hear those pages turning. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19, there the Bible says this, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then if you'll skip to verse 33 there of the same chapter, the Bible says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If we're not of this world and we're not of this kingdom, we are wasting our time and our effort and our energy and our our intellect and our resources on things that do not last and that decay and that break down and that are all going to go away one day. Our very bodies that we're inhabiting are, are just temporal until the Lord raises them up again. 
But everything in this life is temporal except for the souls of men and the word of God and the treasures that we have in heaven. And so while we can work and we might look forward to days where we are uh, enjoying maybe retirement, maybe some of you are there. Oh, please don't live your whole life for retirement. You might die the day before you retire. Or you might retire and realize this is it. There's nothing here. I can't tell you how many people have said, I stopped working, I thought life would be great, and I realized it was empty. Listen, this life is just fading away on us, and we don't live for this life. We don't live for this world. We don't get caught up in the system of this world. Why? Because everything here is temporary, and everything is fading away. And so we are to be investing, 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 not in the stock market alone, not in our 401k, not in all that man says is important that we need to have because we'll die and have all those millions or whatever they might be and leave them to people who will squander them after us. But what we are to do is lay up treasures in heaven because in heaven neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and thieves can't break through or steal and we're with the Lord and everything in heaven is eternal. The treasures the glory and the grandeur of it all. Most importantly, our Savior. I have had the privilege of playing a few games with my family here over the Christmas break, and uh, we like to sit down and play a good game, good board game or something like that. It's good. It's good for the family. Put the devices away, get out a good old-fashioned board game, and just have fun. And we recently, uh, my, my son Johnny, he was given some money for Christmas, and so uh, he wanted to buy the game of life. Now, one thing about board games in my home is that I play my board games differently than I approach life. In life, I'll be, I'll be conservative in some areas. I won't lay it all on the line, and I think that's smart. Uh, when it comes to board games, I just lay it all on the line all the time. And in Monopoly, I'm taking every risk there is. I'm buying every hotel and property there is. I'm, I'm spending as much as I can. That, that's kind of how I play. And for some reason, I always end up last. <laughs> I'm terrible at them. The game of life is a little bit like Monopoly, but I like the game of life a little bit better because rather than just uh, losing everything, you can at least feel like in the game of life you've gained something. And I still lose at the end, somehow or another, even in the game of life. Johnny loves the game of life. And uh, he, he gets his money out, and he, he arranges it all, and he gets his action cards, and he's always trying to keep a tally of how much he has. And I like that game because in it, you kind of consider your own life as you're playing this life, quote-unquote, on a board game. How many kids you have, uh, what college you went to, how much college cost. <laughs> Uh, how many pets you had, and all these kinds of things, and you come to the end of your life in retirement. And the game of life, however, is all still just about what happens here. And we can even see in a board game that the system of this world just thinks temporarily. Temporarily. And while we're living, we think, well, we're going to live forever, but we don't. And life is not a game, ultimately. Ultimately. Life is a gift. And God has given us a life that we are to take and use ultimately for his glory. And my hope and prayer is that our, our life isn't just something temporal that's here for a short while, then we fade off into everlasting judgment separated from God. Oh, I hope that's not your eternity. Remember the kingdom that you're living for. Again, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We are to be seeking another kingdom. And that kingdom is the kingdom of God. It's our home in heaven. It's the place that he has prepared for us. It's where God is. And Jesus is there seated at the right hand of the Father waiting for his children to come home. That's what we look forward to. That's what we are to live for in the here and now. And while we live in a country that I still believe is the greatest country in the world, ultimately I'm not investing my life forever in America. I'm investing my life forever in heaven. And while I'm a passionate patriot, 
I'm a far more passionate Christian. We must remember something. What we see going on around us is happening day by day in the here and now, but there's a greater battle taking place, and that battle is for the souls of men. And every day that we live, we are to be living for the Lord Jesus, and our passion, our burning passion, should be that the souls of men would be saved, that people would turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would see people honestly one to Him. Nothing else matters aside from that. And yes, we want to live in a free society. The Bible tells us to stand fast in liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and freedom is in Christ and from Christ. But our kingdom is heaven. May God help us to have wisdom in these days, to understand all of these things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And remember what the Lord said. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not. It's not what lasts. Heaven does. My question this morning is this. Where is your eternity? I had a funeral of a man named George Wharton yesterday, 90 years old. And what made that funeral service much easier for me was the fact that he knew and loved the Lord. And I could say that. I've also had to preach funeral services of people that didn't have a testimony of knowing and loving the Lord. And that's much more difficult. Because these individuals might have lived a life. They might have experienced a lot of good things in their life or fun things or exciting things. Maybe they ended with a lot of possessions, maybe a lot of family, maybe a lot of money in the bank. But if they die without Christ, they've died with nothing. Nothing but judgment for eternity separated from God. You see, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And you can have that gift, and it can be yours today. But we've been called to live not in love with the world and not conform to the world or friendly to the world, and certainly not to invest solely in this world, but in eternity. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me, even as you're watching I want to ask you this question. Have you trusted in Jesus Christ? Is your eternity going to be with him? Have you believed in him by faith? I hope so. Would you call upon him today and believe him and trust him to save you, to do for you what you cannot do for yourself? And there very quietly in the quietness of this moment, there in your home, on your couch, or sitting at the table, wherever you might be, would you ask him to save you? Simply say these words, dear God, I admit that I am a sinner and I've broken your law and I'm asking you to come into my life and to save me. I believe that Jesus was God's son and that he was crucified, buried, and rose from the dead three days later. And I'm trusting in that to save me. You don't have to acknowledge it publicly, but I hope you will. I hope you will. Maybe there on the live stream you can say, I just prayed that prayer to accept Jesus Christ. You could send us an email at pastor at truthbaptistchurch.com and let us know that you've made that decision. But it's the most important decision a person will ever make. And even if it's not publicly acknowledged now, it will need to be eventually. We hope that you'll let us know that you've made that choice and that you'll come and be baptized and live for the Lord. Christian, I want to ask you this question. If you are saved and you know the truth, is the world starting to get a hold on you? Is the world starting to get a grip on you? Do you feel yourself a little more comfortable today than you were before? Do you feel the clutches of the world system starting to grab you and draw you away? Would you just ask the Lord to help you and confess that to him and, and decide that you're not going to love the world or be conformed to it any longer and say, I'm going to live for, for God, I'm going to live for Christ? 
Maybe you're just investing so much in this world. You're running 100 miles an hour, and it seems like you're saving and investing, and maybe you're doing what seems to be good things. You're thinking about the future. You're building a name. You're building a brand. You're building popularity, whatever it might be. And some of that might seem like it's good, but remember something, none of it lasts. What are we living for? Father, I ask that you'd help us. Help us not to invest too much here. Help us to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Help us to be about the first works. I pray that we would commit in this new year, maybe to being in church and coming together and, Lord, being in the place that you want us to be. Gathering together around the word of God in the church house as we meet back together again. Lord, maybe we need to make a commitment to being in the Word of God, studying it and knowing it and applying ourselves to it again. Or perhaps it's uh, in prayer, because prayer, Lord, truly is powerful and it will make an impact and a difference. Maybe we need to commit to giving and giving financially and faithfully and by faith. Lord, maybe we need to be a witness and tell others about you and do so every day without fail. We just ask for your help. Lord, we ask that we would be able to, through your help, overcome the world and its system. We don't do it by ourselves, but Lord, you have already overcome it. So help us to look to you, follow you, and I, Lord, I pray that you'd help us in the way that we need to go. We do thank you and love you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before you click off and go, let me just say something. Thank you for joining us by way of live stream today. Again, I appreciate your flexibility. Uh, we are looking forward to being back together again tonight at 6 p.m. So I hope you'll join us for that second service today. Join in by way of live stream also again at 6 o'clock. And then I want to encourage you. Let's, after having this pause, just to be careful and make sure that everyone's good and healthy. And so far, from what I understand, everyone's doing great, with the exception of the Williams family, who we're still praying for, and maybe some others who are still recovering from the virus and so forth from you know, a while back, uh, we will be back in person Wednesday night and then for all the normal services next Sunday. Let's make that commitment to be in person here. Uh, we make sure that we're safe here. We take measures to do so. And we hope and pray that you will be committed to being here in person here very soon, Wednesday night and then Sunday. And we're excited about our vision Sunday. We'll get a pin We'll get a vision for what's ahead in 2021 and trust the Lord for all that he'll do. I pray and trust you'll have a wonderful afternoon. God bless you. And Lord willing, I'll see you back here uh, live stream virtually again at 6 p.m. God bless.